Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. <laughs> Sorry for the slow uptake. Let's see what happens when you get old. So we have with us today the wonderful, inimitable, you should be a late night talk show host, Rebecca Ratliff, who after years and years and years of trying to teach the insurance industry how to humanize claims handling, has now moved into humanizing conflict resolution, where we know she's going to be a lot more effective. Um, Bill Harrison, our leading criminal defense attorney, one of our leading civil rights attorney, and a brother of a different mother. So it's just the three of us today. This is just pure trio, you know, piano, bass, and drums. So, Rebecca, you're the keyboards. What would you folks like to talk about today? There's so much. <laughs> there, there is. Well, let me start you with something. I, I was just reading that the Republican Senate is now unifying to demand that President Biden remove Deb Holland as the Interior no Secretary nominee. Um, hopefully, knowing Joe Biden and the rest of his team, that one will fly just about as far as a winged Donald Trump. Um, but to me, it's, it's extremely offensive, not just because my grandmother was Latino Native American, but because if that time has not long since passed, to me, that's pure racism. The reason they're trying to get her out is because she will put a stop to things like the Dakota pipeline and things like that, that are just as egregious treaty violations as the things that Andrew Jackson and people like that did. So when we're talking about white supremacy racism in America, we ain't talking about just black and white. Indigenous peoples have been mistreated as badly or worse as any by White leadership for a long, intentionally, for a long, long time. Well, well, we have to start from the historical perspective here. Number one, um, this was uh, there. This is America was Native Americans. Uh, that is America, and uh, as as mo most imperialists uh, uh, do, they take over uh, lands that they they come into contact with. There's a belief in ownership that uh, ownership can be in, a, in an individual or a family or a nation. And, and clearly, if you talk about indigenous peoples, they see that very differently. Uh, the land that they are on, they're caretakers of that land. No one owns that land um, but the man upstairs. And so uh, they have a total different perspective on that. And clearly, when you have a very conservative white America trying to oust someone like that, it, it's back to where we started. Um, you know, it's back to where we came. It's uh, imperialism, um, you know, white privilege uh, at, its, at its worst. It, basically, a, a president has a right, traditionally, to pick his or her, um, you know, cabinet members, uh, party affiliated members, people that they believe have the same agenda as they have. And so that traditionally has been our political structure to do that. Uh, and, and so this not only smacks it, uh, against that uh, right that's it's from the, our forefathers had written in, in, in the uh, laws to this whole idea of um, imperialism at its worst. And instruction, yeah, and, and obstructionism. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> these are obstructionists who have no clear uh, reason why um, they don't want this choice except to just you know, give the new president a hard time. And it, it's, um, it is a really a, a sad time in America, that we've um, come to the, the the petty fights, and uh, you know, we used to say uh, we'll talk about the devil, but we really didn't. Now, QAnon is in you know in Congress, and it is just really an interesting uh, and sad time for Americans like me who believe that the race that we are all you know called to care about is the human race, and it, it is just. Um, this is really something to watch. I didn't uh, know that in my lifetime I would see this type of behavior, but it just feels like we're living, you know, we've moved back uh, into the 1800s almost. 
or, or worse. Yeah. Or worse. No, and it's it's pure white racism, and there just isn't another name for it. And it's overt, and it's intentional, and they know it is. And forty-five, and they think they need to do that to hold on to the pump share of voters, the sector of the rural, less educated, evangelical population that really thought. He was standing up for them against everybody that didn't look like them or, and talk like them. Exactly. And, and I want to make a point here. I think that the, uh, the president, the former president, um, basically used uh, religion in the wrong way uh, because obviously there are evangelicals who uh, obviously are not uh, of the same ilk as uh, the, the Trump supporters. And like you say, they, they really cater to the uneducated uh, group of folks there uh, to use them um, as sort of their shield uh, as they ran, you know, towards America. And so, you know, they, it, it's really unfortunate that, that people fell into that, uh, uh, that uh, sort of mentality and, and uh, allowed Trump to do that and use them. Uh, you know, Christianity is the foundation of our country. It's the backbone of our country. And, um, the, the mere fact that, that people are Christians in and of themselves doesn't necessarily mean that they're conservatives in, in, in some respect or that they um, have a, a, a political bent such as, you know, the Republican bent and so on. Um, I'm Christian and I'm Democrat, right? So, and it's, there's a, a huge uh, a bunch of folks out there that, that, are, that believe the same way I believe. And, and it's unfortunate they've used that uh, you know, the Bible and, and, that, and that Christian, um, you know, well, Christian uh, belief to uh, really um, use that and ostracize people and also to, uh, to force their agenda on people, which uh, was, is really, you know, unfortunate. Well, the Bible was used to, <laughs> to keep slavery going. Um, it, it's, you know, the Bible has always uh, been used in the manipulation of, of people and, you know, that's coupled with fear. Um, and, you know, just other tactics uh, that have been used to oppress people, keep people down, uh, make people concerned about their fellow man, um, you know, just the, the mistrust. Um, and then add to that misinformation and disinformation. I actually had to look in the dictionary to make a distinction between, I had never, I don't think I had ever heard the word disinformation. Of course, we know misinformation is, you know, uh, wrong information. But disinformation is wrong information on purpose. And I, I don't think I had ever heard that word. So I had to look up the, um, you know, look up the, the distinction between the two words. But it's just it, this is manipulation at a very high level. It's very highly motivated, clearly, because we have what we know to be intelligent enough people just continuing lies and, you know, just the, the falsehoods uh, for political gain. But I have to believe that there's there's more to it and maybe somebody's put it in a time capsule and we'll hear about what really happened. Uh, you know, maybe my son will actually hear what actually happened back when somebody writes the book. But um, I don't think we have any idea what's really going on here and where the motivations uh, truly come from. And there are people who are well-grounded historically, like Heather Cox Richardson, who are really starting to bring out elements of truth. Hey, Isabel Wilkerson with her book, Cats. Um, things that we really need to understand that have been suppressed, that have been intentionally twisted, withheld, buried. Yeah. Because what we've been seeing in this country are not just the last four years or the last 40 yeah. or the last several hundred is intentional inequality. It is a platform, it is a principle that the Republican Party has adopted. Can you imagine in our history, a political party comes into the presidential nomination and comes out of it with no platform? Just whatever he tweets, that's our platform. That's it. Now that's not embarrassing, that's shameful because what he treats, tweets is racist, it's misogynist, it's extremely destructive 
and it's anti-humanity. And I think for those of us whose values, be you Christian like Bill and Becca or Zen Buddhist like me, underneath respecting the equal value of the human spirit in each person, what they do with it may be different, how they express it and treat people may be different, but that innate human spirit in and of itself has a value that should unify us. And you don't have to be religious to see that. You just have to be fair-minded. When my son was eh, five years old, we kept reading to the kids up to five or six or even seven because it's such a nice way to end the day, right? You're lying down up against a pillow. You're reading to your kid. You know, there's a closeness. There's a quiet. And books take you into a world that you can go in together with your child. And it's just wonderful. So I was reading to him about racial tensions in the inner city back in the 1950s. And he looks at me. I didn't really do that. I said, oh, yeah, much worse than that, much more cruel than that. Five-year-old looks at me, shakes his head. One word, stupid. I have come finally, almost 70 years later, to understand where that came from in him, what it meant to him. What it meant to him was they don't have the human intelligence to be a human being or treat people as human beings. They're just not smart enough to do that. They're not morally bad. They're stupid. They are lacking in that intelligence to recognize and value humanity. Disconnect and decency. Um, but you, you also hit on uh, systemic racism, structural racism. It's baked in bias. It's, it's, it's worse than that. Um, it is the willingness, regardless of the evidence to the contrary, to, um, to, partic to participate in systems that, that keep people down, Black and brown people, um, maybe uh, people who are, I don't think we use the word handicapped anymore, uh, people who have a disability, um, whether it be physical or mental, we uh, ostracize people as a society. But then those, those the structural racism piece um, further, it just it keeps people out of neighborhoods and it keeps people out of jobs and it uh, restricts participation and inclusion. And it's, it's a cancer in our society. Yeah, no, and I, and, and I agree with that, absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I, I keep going back to religion, but one of the things that uh, was part of a sermon this, this past weekend was this whole idea of um, selfishness and pride and how those two things really um, can destroy, uh, obviously, you, unity, most importantly, unity, because a selfish person, it's not selfless. A selfish person does not think about anyone else. A, a selfish person lets pride get in the way um, of proper decision making. And so I think that that, that really, on top of stupidity, um, is a real problem for a lot of people. And that we have to refocus and rethink about uh, our selfishness and what we want. It's always we, what we want, what, what I want, okay? Instead of what the community deserves as a whole and what we best for the community because we as a as a civilization never made it anywhere without a community we didn't make it the the, the single people the single individuals throughout history um, never made it it was the community that always supported the person and that community you know existed thrived survived and we have to get back to that mentality of selflessness versus selfishness that's a good point, Bill. It is, so is it is it unwillingness or is it inability or it, is it incapacity? What is it? It's, it's a wrong mindset that we are, as from, from childhood and, and a lot of communities, that mindset is instilled in us, um, that we come first, that we are the best, um, that you don't get anywhere in this world unless you're the best and, and you have to, um, you know, 
scratch, claw, and, and climb over people and get where you're supposed to be. We had that in our former leader, okay? That was his mentality and his upbringing. And, and, and we have to get away from that. So obviously it's, it's a, um, uh, a disconnect from the old and a reconnect to a different mindset. It really is a mindset. And, and as um, uh, Chuck is saying, it starts with families and children and, and you know, properly raising your child and, and instilling in that child those types of, you know, moral uh, beliefs, um, understandings, uh, uh, educating them in the proper uh, framework, laying down with them before they go to sleep, reading them to them, you know, um, very critical reading to them. And, and children understand that. People say, well, you can't read that stuff to children. Yes, you can, because they definitely have the capacity to understand. So we, we need to, to rethink how we address um, our views, our societal views in the sense of being selfless versus selfish. And I think, Bill, that you folks have hit right on the heart of the matter. I was going through this with my MBA class in Vietnam one time. Wonderful students, best students I ever had. Um, they live in a collectivist society, so they have a kind of advantage which honors ancestors and generations and connections and relationships. Anyway, we were exploring what is it that cultivates and motivates that greed, that selfishness, that really destructive manifestation of self. And when the choice and the ability to connect with people of choosing the opposite, is, is so much happier, so much re more rewarding, brings so much more peace. And, and one of the students, very insightful young man, said, you know, maybe we're all insecure. Maybe sometimes the insecurity, we feel we're not going to be able to succeed in that competition. We're not going to be able to get those rewards. We're, it's a zero sum life game. And that makes us more competitive. It makes us less trusting. It makes us engage in more of the conflict behavior, less of the collaborative behavior. And we thought about that. We talked about that for a little while. And then we started to see looking at the most destructive leaders in world history Hitler, Trump, others, Mussolini, right? These are all people who manifest that extreme insecurity. It's a classic textbook, Narcissus Cape. But it's not the insecurity that makes them the most destructive. They go public with it because they are overconfident in their ability to get away with it. That they can manifest that insecurity in destructive negative emotions, attacking people, tearing down people. And that will somehow build them up by tearing down the other. And they pick on the people that they feel are least like them. And they do it very superficially, the way they look. So I was in a book club conversation, I think we talked about this a little bit, where a wonderful participant, nice older white lady asked the question, how do I not be seen as just another Karen? Hey, and it went around for a little while. And so her friends on in the book club said, oh, don't worry about that. We all know you. We know you're very open-minded. You treat people all fairly. And, and another person said, yeah, plus we're in Ann Arbor. It's a bastion of liberalism. You know, we don't have to worry about that. Hey, and I thought to myself, well, number one, if you really want to not be another Karen, and I would be the male equivalent, whatever that is, you have to not be another Karen. You have to be a person who is not just seen, but known as one whose closest friends, whose family, whose chosen companions in life are diverse people, older, younger, people of color, people of different backgrounds. And my kids have become those people. I've tried to live to become that person. 
My mother, a small town in northern Louisiana woman, white woman, lived to become that kind of person. It's so much better choice. Jump into the salad bowl. Join the daikon and the lemongrass and the lettuce and the tomatoes and the cucumbers where everybody has their own texture and flavor and value and color and everybody has a place and the salad would be less if we weren't all in there. That's right. Join the, the yeah, the sweet, the salty, the crunchy. <laughs> yeah, the experience is much more rich and so is the flavor when you, uh, when you have that inclusivity piece. Um, people get diversity and inclusion all mixed up. It's, you know, first um, diversity and inclusion was the, the tag phrase, and then it became inclusion and diversity because inclusion was the piece that everybody was missing. So look, there are two black people in the room, but, but they're not saying anything. They're not making any contribution and they have a special set of skills that you're not using or, um, you know, enabling. And then, so it went from, uh, diversity and inclusion to inclusion and diversity. And then it went to DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, because we had to drive the point home a little more by adding equity. And now it's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, because guess what? Still institutionalized, didn't really understand the inclusion piece. And now we have to add the belonging component to try to, um, to focus on retention, because you may get some bright stars, but it's hard, you know, to keep them because they don't feel like they belong. They're not supported. So it's, um, we, you know, we have these struggles in, in, um, in our country. And if we, if we all stick together and have open conversations, um, Chuck and I are famous for our good trouble <laughs> <laughs> conversations and projects. Um, it's, you know, we'll, I, I believe, I have to believe we'll be okay. Um, because a lot of people have worked very hard for us to be okay. And there's one more. Diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging are absolutely wonderful. But until you have crossed the bridge with those to empowerment, you're not there. That's and right. So I think what we're That's talking a good point. about is not just a seat at the table, but a decision-making, influencing, heard seat at the table. That's H-E-A-R-D not H-E-R-D, right? That's equity partners in law firms. That's C-suite in corporate. That's department and agency heads and deputies in government. Those are what we need to see. That needs to happen. We need to look at a society in which our leadership reflects not just the best of diversity, but the best of diverse choices. Because we know statistically, the more diverse your decision-making group, the more comprehensive the perspectives, the understanding, and the more sustainable the decision and the action taken will be, and the more beneficial for the greater range of people. And we're sitting here today because we love that mix, right? Go ahead. Well, you just gave me another title. <laughs> I'm listening to you talk about herd, H-E-A-R-D versus herd. And then I wrote down from C-suite to C-suite and I meant S-E-E suite. We don't just want to see people. We actually want them to be in leadership positions, in power positions, in decision-making positions. Um, that, that's exactly right. Uh, there are all these optics uh, sometimes that we see in corporate America um, where it, it looks like it looks good, but the boxes are just being checked off. And the people who really are making decisions um, are not, they, they don't look, they don't look black and brown. Um, you know, they don't look like other uh, diverse uh, people in other diverse categories. We have to get there. Yeah, exactly. You, you need to open the door, you need to open your mind and uh, I'll take a little a phrase from Rebecca. You got to rewind at that point. Uh, and, you know, it, it really is, uh, as, you're, as you're indicating, Chuck, it really is a, an idea that once we do this, it's better for everyone. Um, obviously, not only uh, for the person getting through the door, but that person is going to lend so much to 
the dialogue, to the conversation, to the growth of where you want to go, because you don't know that perspective. And that pr perspective completes the pie for everyone. Um, and so it, it's, it's about getting as well as allowing someone to get. I think it, it's just the other half of the, uh, the pie. And as we move into our last couple of minutes, where we are, and maybe one of the things we can think about is we're not just opening doors. We are making conscious, intentional choices of diversity or diversity, equity, inclusion, and empowerment state because it brings more value. Exactly. And I look at, somebody asked me, so, What's the biggest difference for you in the pandemic? And I said, frankly, more choice. If we really, and I think that's the result of this election, we finally have back more real choice. Let's use that choice to elevate the people who have been marginalized, the people who have been underserved, the people who deserve to have their value recognized, honored, and to have places where they can have a voice in how they're treated. So thanks for being part of that. Last thought, Bill, Rebecca. Inclusion, not exclusion, unity. Race that matters is the human race. You got it. Thank you all. This has been wonderful. Uplifting, hopefully. And we'll see you all in two more weeks. Hopefully sure, thank you. And Radine back. Thank you. Yeah, stay safe. Don't stay silent.